Welcome back everyone to Stay at Your Lane. I'm your host, John Maley, brought to you by Triple T Transport. Uh, guys, I'm anxious to get back into this one. Strategic versus transactional, technologies impacts, where are we at? Is it, uh, is it the same game it's always been? Or what's changed and how has it changed uh, with the impact of uh, all of the technology that we're utilizing on a day in and day out basis? So uh, to pick it back up, we were talking about partnerships. So, you know, we're a, we're a provider that's going to be the value added role. Uh, we're going to be someone that you're going to want to partner with for uh, your, your high profile business that needs to be delivered on time, that you can set a clock by from a commitment perspective. That's your no fail option is the role we fill. Okay. So there's some balancing there from the partnership to the transactional. And I would love to hear uh, anyone's thoughts that's watching uh, this podcast. I want to hear where their, where their head is, what they agree or disagree with, because I think this is a subject matter that it brings a lot of value to everybody from all sides. I think for many shippers, navigating and understanding that it's more than price and it's what value you're going to get at the end of the day uh, from the partnership is bigger than than the lane specific pricing and whether it's you know 10% higher or 10% lower than what they're seeing previously. What are your thoughts on that, uh, Glenn? Yeah, I think you know ultimately companies want a fair price. I think fair is determined by situation and you know desperation or kind of the position they're in. And so, you know, my take on this kind of what you're describing is there are many, many companies, both that are buyers of transportation, whether you're a shipper or a 3PL, that don't first understand that, you know, what type of customer is that to you? Uh, so I think oftentimes shippers assume it's a one-way street where carriers are just there to, you know, lay down and do whatever they need. But the reality is, is carriers segment their business, at least the ones that are most effective, as you need to describe. So, you know, number one is down on your network. Number two is understand kind of your carrier segmentation. And three is the inverse of that. You have to understand how your providers look at you as a shipper uh, and make sure that that marriage is correct. If any of those three are off, I think it creates some of the things you're talking about, which is the, the desperation phone call about, hey, you know, this carrier dropped the ball on me. I need you to pick it up and you just do this. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Uh, Joe, what are your thoughts? Well, again, I'll, uh, I'll put my old Nestle hat on. When we looked at carriers, brokers, you know, providers, you know, we, we looked at guys that could, uh, that could provide capacity, you know, your bigger guys, uh, the Schneiders, the hubs, guys like that. Then we looked at guys that were high service carriers. Because again, we, we had customers, you know, like a Costco or someone like that, that we had to deliver. We had to deliver on time. We, maybe we got in trouble on pricing or something else with them. So we had, to, we had to get in there and deliver it on time, complete. So in my case with Nestle, we had a pretty big private fleet when I first joined them. When we had problem customers or, you know, challenging customers, we had to make that delivery. We could we we would just throw our private fleet on there. I mean, we controlled the driver, we controlled the asset. They had Nestle on their shirt, Nestle on the truck, so it made it. We we could react to those a lot quicker than other maybe some other food manufacturers that didn't have private fleets. So I think at the end of the day, you you look at your carriers, you segment them, and uh, you play to their strengths. And again, on the car like like Glenn said, on the carrier side, they're looking at you. Are you consistent? Do you always nickel and dime them? Do you always come in at the last minute, you know, with 10 loads on a Friday that they, they got to cover? So, and, and your pricing, their pricing to you reflects that. So, uh, big thing is to segment the carriers, put them on lanes where they can succeed, have your backups, and have your high value carriers that, that you know at the end of the day they can, they, can, they can make something happen. Yeah, maybe at a different price, a higher price, but they can make it happen. So, that's my soapbox. If there's you know, shippers listening or even carriers, as you talk to your your shippers, then there's four ways I segment you know a, a carrier base personally, and I would suggest the inverse from carrier back to your shipper, right? So number one is who are your key partners that are there? 
right? Mm-hmm. Toughest customers, most important customers, uh, consistent business, right? I think, you know, those, we all thrive off consistency, right? In the yeah. transport world, in the management world, you name it, consistency is key. But uh, so number one is who are your key partners? Uh, number two, who are your niche partners, right? And niche means different things to different folks. This could be you know, specialized equipment, could be a legacy relationship, uh, it could be a uh, a certain facility that's got project customers, things like that. But there's always a place where you need niche providers. Third is, you know, who are your challengers? Right? Who are the companies that are on the cusp of being great or potentially on the cusp of, of going out? Right. That applies to both you know, transport companies and to shippers. And then lastly, who are your new providers? Right. And you always got to be growing. You've always got to be testing the market, regardless if you're an up cycle or down cycle. You are creating that marriage. So it's one understood, and two on the operational world, the technology is leading kind of that relationship environment, which is awesome. Well, I appreciate you um, you breaking it down into the, the four that I think we all agree on are keys to building a network. Uh, for every shipper, these percentages in these four are going to vary. Do we agree on that? Yeah, absolutely. Depends, depends on your network and your business model. Absolutely. Uh, we're able to bring more value with more consistency from our shippers. Yeah. Consistency from any perspective is a positive in our industry, and it drives drives costs down. It allows us to be more competitive, etc. Now, this is one that always it always gets my dander up. When a shipper comes to you and says, we got 24 of these shipments a year and we want to contract it, but they're not regular. It's not every other week. It'll be seasonal from a perspective. Uh, when it's warm out, we're going to sell more of it. And when it's cold, we're not going to, we're not going to really do much of it at all. That's a spot type of scenario or a transactional scenario. There's not enough volume there for it to be routine. There's no leverage with it. It actually hurts because it's so sporadic and seasonal. So that's not something that you can really go out and handle that way. I would take lanes like that and I would say, hmm, maybe those are going to be new provider opportunities. It would fit in that of the, of the four. Yeah, that or, or a niche carrier, sure. Or sure. a niche, you know, it would fit in either of those two. And if, if anybody watching and, and watching this podcast please feel free to share any comments or, or open it up. I think the relationship has to be established. What potential is there? Where, you, where we struggle is, is really getting that sometimes honest and clear because inevitably we're going to rise through people's network as they understand what values we, we have the ability to bring. Well, well, yeah, I mean, you, you got to know your business pretty good. You got to know your lanes and you got to know your carriers. And uh, we'll get back to new carriers. I mean, one thing I did when I was with Nestle, I, I always returned phone calls from carriers, brokers. You know, they would leave me a voicemail. Because, again, you never know when you're going to find someone that may be a diamond in the rough there. You know, maybe I'd save them all up and I'd make the, return the phone calls or if there were new carriers that wanted to come in, I gave them a three hour block of time where I would talk to them because you never know what you're going to, you know, you never know what you're going to find if you don't talk to new people. So I think that's really important. I know a lot of shippers, you know, they, their time is very short and they want to, you know, m- maybe deal with their, their regular carriers and their, and their core carriers. But you, you always got to talk to new people because you could get new ideas and new, uh, new ways of doing business. New opportunities. Glenn. Yeah, absolutely. You had mentioned something earlier on a uh, on a different episode, which is the proliferation of a three digit zip kind of bid. And you, one of the things you're describing in that customer example, where it's you know 24 loads a year, I think it was, and you want to contract it, is one thing you can do is change how your network is presented to carriers. And there's not always a perfect answer, right? But right. you know, historically. You know, we went city to city and you would have that lane that was 24 times a year. But, you know, if you look at a three digit zip, it may increase the uh, available loads to create somewhat of a corridor. Right. And create that consistent lane. So yeah, I think a couple of things. One is separate out your 
partner or kind of your network relationship versus the lane level relationship. Right. And then two is you got to take a step back and look at your network to see as a shipper, how can I present my network more carrier friendly and create that, that stronger marriage. And so, you know, I, I would agree with all the comments. Um, we need to help each other, right? No one's got the perfect answer. Yes, we all want to run our business flawlessly, but we need each other to improve. So create that marriage between uh, buyer and, and seller to help each other and, and find and challenge each other what we can do. Hey, um, I agree 100%. I think that it, it always comes back to the relationship. Sometimes the technology is allowing us to do different things, but I also think it, it also puts many shippers in a position where they, they fall asleep at the wheel because the TMS system does so much for them. And what, what the TMS system doesn't do is what we're talking about today. Vitally important, brings value from every perspective. Efficiency, uh, technology, the tracking, all the things that we're doing on a regular basis that we weren't doing 25 years ago, they're, the, they're part of the foundation. They're here to stay. They're going to improve and they're going to bring value to us and to our shippers and allow us to bring more value to each other. But I think at the end of the day, the relationship that you establish is everything. It's, it still is. And I would agree with your earlier statement, Glenn, on the earlier episode is how I would, I would want to leave it. Do you agree, Joe? Yeah, I, I do agree. And I think one thing, John, maybe uh, maybe for a future podcast might be uh, what are the characteristics of a strategic shipper versus a transactional shipper? What, what do strategic shippers do that make them strategic and make the, and make carriers want to do business with them? So I think that would be an inter- interesting podcast to get feedback from uh, from a carrier, from other shippers, from technology providers like Glenn. Um, Glenn, would you be interested in joining us on that? Always happy to help. All right. Wonderful. What I'll do is um, I'll take that advice, Joe. Uh, I'll invite a couple other shippers, some new faces that maybe uh, you guys aren't familiar with, get some outside perspective, and yep. uh, we'll reconvene in the future on this. John, I had one question. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned before you get your dandruff up. How do you get your dandruff up? I don't understand. Dan- dander. When you get your dander up, the hair on the back of your oh. neck stands up. Okay. okay. I, unfortunately, uh, I am going gray also, Joe, um, but I don't have enough up here for it to really matter. Uh, don't so, tell me where you're going gray. I don't want to know. I, I got a face for radio, Joe. We're not just three pretty faces is what you're saying? I hate to be the one that says it, but... That's a, that's a, that's a hard blow. We are, we're, we're built for transportation, right? The chair. That's where we're at. 29 years of it. Glenn, you're 22? 22. Joe, how many years have you done it now? Uh, 47. And you've taught transportation at university, at the university in Illinois? Yeah, I I was an adjunct for a couple of years, yeah. All all those people I taught, they're in different majors now. They got out of logistics (laughs) and supply chain. (laughs) They saw you and said, forget this. Some of them are philosophy majors and archaeology majors now. Archaeology. All right. Well, thank you both for uh, joining us. We appreciate it very, very much. And we're going to continue this because I think this is, this is one we, could, we can talk about indefinitely. All right. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Yeah.